I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I want to be successful. I want financial support. I want affordable health service. I want to be powerful. Powerful. Supported. Inspired. Connected. Educated. 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 I want specialized banking. I want maternal care. I want to be a part. I am a woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a W woman. When I interviewed Adesua Oyenokwe, I call her Auntie Adesua. She had just lost her father. Actually, she was just about to go to the village to bury him. Either it was the day after or two days after we had this interview. So I was so humbled that she thought enough of me and enough of this project to be able to sit down and have me interview her. Now, when I sat down with her, emotions were still really raw. The death of her father was still fresh, but also were the lessons that he taught her, as you can see in this clip. I was born in 1963. My father was a civil servant and he was based in Ibadan. And so I was born in Ibadan. But the Republic was formed in 1963, the same year. That's when Nigeria became a Republic. And in that year as well, they formed another region, which was Midwest, out of, out of um, the Western region. So my dad, who's from Edo State, Benin, Bendel State at some point, went back home as a civil servant. But I was a baby, so they left me until I was about one year or so before we could come back home. So I grew up in Benin City and um, grew up the daughter of a civil servant, you know, who later became a chief. The earliest memories I have from growing up in Benin City is living on a street that's called Lagos Street. You know, it holds a lot of memories for me. I'm goosing up just thinking about it. My father's mother got a house in that location because she used to fry Akara, you know. She was the only one that had a home in Benin when my father was transferred. He didn't have a home, so we all lived there. So he had an older sister and a younger brother and all of us lived in, on hindsight, there were only three rooms in that house then. All of us, there were three families living there. And I remember the backyard being a big one with all the wives going around one common um, firewood pot. And they're cooking and they're quarreling and all those little kids running around. The only the highlight of our day used to be my mom by calling all of us to sit down. I want more me da. I worry, you know, we sit down because when they give her a meal, she cuts every little one. And, you know, every child we queue up according to age and then they give us. But you see, that family life more or less prepared me for the kind of person I am today. It's only on hindsight that I'm thinking about that. And in that neighborhood, there were houses, there were Yorubas. Everybody was one and the same. If you look back now, it's like they were dep deprived lives because we shared everything, you know. Everybody eats in a big bowl and then we ate. So we, things didn't really change for us, really, even in, no, not with the war. It was just the fact that something exciting was happening that was different and had our parents worried. Then we didn't think we were worried. It's now I look back, you know, they were worried that we, is it going to get here? What's going to happen to them? What happened to all the kids? And sometimes in the evening, they would go, there would be some siren and they would show all of us inside, go into the house, go on that, you know, and we're like, what are we hiding for, you know? But we'd hide, but it was fun. It was like buju buju, or, you know, some hide and seek kind of game for us as kids. But I guess parents must have been worried, but to us, we're just, living life like nothing. My father raised so many children. He had biologically 12 children. One is passed from my mother and another woman. But in the house, I think he took it from his own mother because his mother just opened his home to everybody. In our house, we had at any point in time at least 20 or 25 people because cousins were you know, people who had problems, or my brother's friends, or my friends would just be there. And he has, his home was open to everybody. But he actively raised a whole number of children, paying their school fees, doing all kinds of things. And in reading the kind of tributes, I got tributes from people who had just passed through the house for, 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 for maybe six months, because they lived there. And they heard my dad pass and say, ah, ah, that man, one person described him aptly. In my language, they said, Obwera, boom. Obwera, it's like an Iroko. You know, like the biggest tree in the bone is to break. Obera bone. 
Am I me a boy? They have never seen any like him because he was like a comet that came. But he lived to be 84, right? He lived to be 84. And even in his last few months, I was beginning to say, Daddy, that's God. Why are you still keeping this man alive? He was incontinent. He had had an operation that, wasn't, that didn't go too well. He wasn't too happy with himself. Before he died, I had gotten a call saying that um, Daddy hadn't eaten for two days for my older sister, because my father had a daughter before he married my mom. She's now in Benin. My older daddy had I said, but why haven't you been taken to the hospital? He says, eh, there's no money. I said, how can you say there's no money? You take him first and ask for money. So now this was a Thursday. Friday, Saturday, he says, I want to get a doctor to go there. Saturday, what's happening? Eh, the doctor hasn't been able to come. He's going to come on Saturday. So I said, right, on Sunday. I said, okay, why are you always calling me? Call my older brother. I said, call him. Let him take care of the situation, you know? Now, Sunday comes and she calls. Ah, he still hasn't come, oh, but I put a doctor. Doctor says it's emergency. I'd have to give him oxygen. I say, but why did you believe it so long? Why? Eventually, they got into the hospital. I was supposed to go to Benin on the Thursday of that week for a funeral, one of his cousins, one of his numerous cousins. He said, okay, I'm coming to Benin on Thursday, and, um, and uh, at least I'll see him then. Monday, I called. I people found the car. He said, they brought a cardiologist. He actually had a heart attack. Now, I'm going through this because when they called me on Wednesday morning, about six, I saw a missed call at about 6, um, 6.50. And I was, I said, okay, when I'm going, I was dressed up going to the gym in the morning. My sister said, this is very unusual. She was one with in the hospital. She's calling me at 6.50. So I called and said, and she said, daddy's gone, daddy's gone. You know, all I did was I told my driver, stop, take me back home. My kids, I have two little girls who are 16 and 14. So what's wrong? I said, just take me back home. I went back home and I got to my, my husband was still home, right and left. And I was like, daddy's gone. And I started to cry like a baby because I felt so responsible. I said, if I had, if I had only gone, because the day if I was saying I wanted to come, I wanted to come. But I said, no, what are you coming to do? But you know why I was so pained as I look back? Because I realized, I don't know if I ever did tell him how much he had impacted my life. I don't think so. And I said, I never got the opportunity to even say a final bye-bye. Even though he like was the, the light of my life. He's kind of, but, but it's like, he's not just mine. He's not just mine, but he was such a joyous and joyful and cheerful person. Up until a few days before he passed, even though he was already suffering from senility, I would say. Where are you calling from? I say, I'm calling from Lagos. I wanted to go to Lagos. I say, but I was not living in Lagos. He say, oh, you know, I'm only kidding. And he would laugh. But I said, so that is full stop. I would never be able to tell this man that he taught me the three most important things, things in life. Hope. Hope. Because whenever you ask daddy for something, he would say, okay, I will give it to you later. And even if later came and he never gave it to you, he'll tell you later again, you know? But it made me hope and perseverance and patience. Whenever he wasn't able to do it, you know, he said, don't worry, next time. Kept on keeping. And then the spirit of cheerfulness that in all things, no matter what it is. When I was reading his tributes, my older brother shared something which I didn't even know. How once they went to daddy. And then daddy showed them his past book. It was in the bed. He was in the red most of the time. So we thought he was just giving us what we wanted. You know what I mean? Anyway, it was in the red because he was looking after so many people. Because I find myself in those situations today that I'm like, I'm torn apart in just trying to survive. And I'm concerned about so many things. And I ask myself, why am I not rich? Why don't I have money? What have the much, the much I've put into my work, the much I've put into life, by now I should be, you know, swimming in money. But you see, I give, give, give. First of all, I have six kids. Come on, how many people can really afford to take care of six kids? But I had those kids because I just wanted to be open to life. And I spend my money raising them and I'm worried and look at my my father lived all his life 
with a red bank account and he was never unhappy? Never! Who am I to be unhappy that I don't have certain things that I, I would like to have now? Because you see, I told you, my father taught me hope. But even if you didn't get what you wanted today, you can get it tomorrow. That's what's most important in life. So I was pained that I didn't get to tell him that that's what he gave me. He wasn't a, wasn't a saint. I mean, hey, look, he had other women. But any child he had, he would bring the child home for whatever reasons. And you know, as I look back, I mean, I saw like, when I got married, is now I think I'm like, when I got married, one of the things he told me as I was getting married, which is very, very unusual, because I think, Sadeswa, never deprive your husband. I'm like, God, dad telling me that. But you know, you know how embarrassing, never deprive your husband. And you know, at those times and those moments when I find myself feeling like my husband is being too demanding, in bed, for example, I remember what my dad said, never deprive your husband. So even if I don't, it's not I look at hindsight and say, maybe, who knows what he was saying? That it means satisfy your husband all the time. Maybe it was his own way of telling me, I'm sorry for the things I did. Maybe there was a reason I don't know. Because my mom also has her own issues. I don't know. She would have to tell me what she, what she did. But he, he told, it's now that I look back and I say, hmm, maybe in some ways, my mom wasn't welcoming enough. Who knows? I don't know. He should have tried to make her welcoming. Because I'm a woman, I know how difficult it can be. Maybe not. But it's that singular advice that he gave me made me almost understand maybe this man probably, you know, it doesn't excuse him. No, it doesn't excuse him. When he passed, and I was one that brought the news to my mom, because nobody else could. I'm their first daughter together, you know? And my mother called me, okay. I had to change my flight for the next day, hop on it, and I had to tell my mom, I said, because she knew he was not, she had been calling all day, where's your dad, where's your dad, where's your dad? Nobody has told me anything, I mean, it's you. I said, okay, so I came like, I mean, I'm coming for the burial the next day, there was a funeral the next day. I walked into the house and said, oh, well, trying not to cry because we, were, we had cried all we wanted to cry. And I walked in and I'm like, okay, mommy, uh, so why is daddy? So, I'm calling, I don't know. As I walked in, my brothers came in from the back. I had to pray like I'm going down to find out what they've done. And I went down and I said, I came back to her. And I said, Daddy is gone. You know what she said? What a pity. What a pity. My language was sorry. My father's name was Abraham. She says, Osoye A B. She used to call him A B. Osoye A B. So it was a pity. You know, because it meant that there was something she wished she had done for him. But she'd spent the last 10 years of her life just caring for that man because she didn't want anybody to know his condition, that he was incontinent and, you know, she would manage him because she was over 80 and she was getting, because when she was, he was going to the hospital, she told me, you know, I told him that I'm tired. I said, mommy, don't worry, you have tried. I said, I told him I'm tired, I won't go to the hospital again. I'm tired. And then maybe that's why he left. I said, no, you never know because he just didn't struggle. It was his time. So for me, the lesson I take away from my father's death is it's a full stop for him. Yeah, it's going to be a full stop for a lot of us and a lot of people that we love. So you're better off just telling whoever you love what you want to tell them because that full stop will happen. That full stop. I thought, okay, I'll be able to meet him in bed and then, you know, I know, I know he knows that we loved him because, I mean, my mom wasn't happy with a lot of things that he did, but would always say, forgive daddy now, forgive daddy now, because he knew we loved him. He cared for him, but I loved his generosity. And I thank God that he has given that to me. And it's sad that it's only in death that you remember those things. But I know somehow, somewhere, maybe you'll be hearing and you will know. You know how all of us grow in faith? I remember as kids, every morning, because I was reading all the tributes, and I'm like, every morning, 6.30 a.m., we came, even if we went to a party, everybody must get up for morning devotion. That morning that my dad passed, as I was, I meditated every morning, mental prayer, I was just telling myself, have I been able to help my parents spiritually? What they've gave to me, have I given back to them? Because they're tired, they are old. They don't have the time to do a lot of things. They don't even have the zeal or the desire. And I told myself, when I go back this time, I'm going to make sure I have devotion with them every morning when I go. 
gone and go, we stay in a hotel. Even if I stay at home, I wake up late because it's a holiday for me. They are old, they don't even bother. Do I know whether they pray? That's why I was very pained that I couldn't get to do that with them. As soon as I got to believe. That, the next morning, my mother and I said, Mom, we're going to start this devotion every day. What you put taught us? I didn't want to budge it. I didn't want to insist. They made us do it. But they were too old to do it anymore. So I worried about the spiritual state. I said, God, just when you put this thought in my mind, you didn't even give me the opportunity to do this with my father. But then I said, okay, maybe he wants me to do it with my mother. She's the one that needs to really forgive my father for all he did to her, for all the infidelities, for all those things, because she was a bitter woman. She was upset and unhappy, you know? So maybe the man has gone to rest so that she can unravel and get that relationship. Because the truth is, in time, it's the state of which we die that God will judge all of us. The works will be judged by the works that we've done. My father, even with all his, the things that he did for people, somehow God will have mercy. I know God will have mercy. Women in my mother's generation just assume that Whatever the man does, you accept and you live with it. Meanwhile, you'll be boiling internally, right? You'll be boiling, you're struggling. And so you're not the best woman that you can be or the best mother. Then my generation, we came up in that women's right, no way. I ain't going to take that, right? I ain't going to take that means that if anything goes wrong, I'm out of here. Like I told you, that's not my intention. And many people are hopping out of here, really. People are breaking up and just giving in not realizing that it takes work. You gotta work at it. You gotta consciously work at it. When you sit down and say, look, I am committed to you for the rest of my life. That's what it is. It's like, I call it beautiful jail. It's a jailhouse. So I kind of identified with her more only after I got married, sadly. Because my mom didn't spend the time to try to make us hate my father. She should have made us hate my father. Do you understand know what I mean? She just left us. When we would be saying, you know, she would complain and say, Mommy, forgive me now. It doesn't matter. I don't know whether it is true. I don't know whether. But the kids were there. They would bring the kids. My mom would take them. My mom would take them. She may not smile and have and love, but she took all those kids. And we were raised as one. I still praise my father because much as people bothered him, marry, 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 marry. He stopped with my He could have had three wives. He stopped with my mom. He would say, After all, you had the one now. You know what I mean? Because people marry three, four wives, but at least I'm, you know, it's just you. When a cousin or an older sister gets married, you find a younger person that goes with them. My mom had that kind of situation. She was young. Her parents couldn't take care of her. So it's not like a, like a help. She was raised hard. You know, it's her uncle, but her uncle didn't treat her right. You know, she was raised hard. You know, because we raised people like that in my home. But they were just like the rest of us. There was no difference. Maybe that's why she came into her home and opened her home to people. Because she didn't have that growing up. She told us of how she would eat the bottom of the pot. How she would, you know. So it's when we got older, I could understand why she was just... So her emotions went things she would share very easily. So she would just... But she wanted us to be better people. That was clear. So when she would shout at me, where have you been all day? Oh, make your bed. Oh, it was just for my own good. But I didn't like it. And I just said, this woman, ah. But daddy will shake us, laugh, gist. My mom didn't find that easy to do with us. So it was just not, we're old. Instead of having kids before we realized, what she was being intrusive in our lives. So we didn't have that. So I always wished that I would have a daughter first. And God gave that to me. And I set out to make her my friend. You know what I mean? So that we will share everything together. I will be open to her. Well, when she was 14 and she had her first boyfriend and I knew what mom went through. And she's like, oh, uh, I have this boyfriend. Said, Boy, what? You're only GS3. But you see, because I, was I had to prepare myself and calm down. And I said, oh, boyfriend, indeed. But what does that mean, really? Oh, he sent me a card. I said, okay, really, let me see the card. So instead of shouting, I negotiated. I said, well, the truth is, at this point in time, what she, the most important thing in life is to first of all get your degree. Say, said, mom, I said, yeah, get your certificate. I said, mom, I'm so far away. I said, yes, but you know, because boys can be a distraction. But why don't you just have like three or four such boyfriends? 
Says no, say, yeah, just have three or four. Till today she tells me you tell me to have three or four. Yes. So that your emotions are not focused on one person, you will be, you will be um distracted. What's more important? Get a degree. But guess what? By the time she was, I can't remember how old she was. She came back home once I was clearing her cupboard and she saw the card that the guy sent. I said, ah, I remember mommy, you telling me that one day you're not even going to remember this guy. That's what I told her. One day you won't even remember this guy. He says, it's true. Can you see it? I said, I'm happy I have that relationship with her. She's 27. And all her friends are getting married. And she called me up there and said, oh, aren't you worried? I said, worried about what? I would rather you're married at 30, actually, when you're a bit more mature and you know what you're doing. I said, ah, don't tell your friends that to her. I said, yeah, but it's the truth. When you're confident. I know I would like to have a, you know, a grandchild, but I want you to be prepared and ready. Otherwise, it's not the, if, you are, if you know who you are before you marry, he said, well, you got married at 25. I was lucky, period. I found the guy I wanted at 25. And he was ready, I was ready. But don't be under any pressure. If you've not found the guy, you've not found the guy, period. Let me give an example of my faith and my religion. I was born and raised as a Baptist, you know, on this issue of faith. And um, I'm giving us an example of how people will do what they have to do. It's what you put in them that matters. I met a man who is Catholic, who lives his faith and believed that we should get married in the Catholic Church. We must go to the same church. It only made, it only made sense. I was in love. It didn't matter to me, right? So I became Catholic. I went to marry in the Catholic Church. All right. But I didn't become Catholic until about seven or eight years into my marriage when I chose to become Catholic. I chose. It suddenly dawned on me. Why did I choose? Because I was exposed to certain things, not by my husband. I started to seek. Because how it is that, okay, I just go into church. You stand up, you sit down with everybody. What's the point? You've got to understand what you're doing. I sought, I read, I asked, and I found faith. So after that, I tell my kids, you know what? Religion, I will give you. But faith, you will find. I can't make you do anything. I desire her to be married because I enjoy marriage. I like the fruits of marriage, but I know at what price you get that fruit. Any person who's not ready, there's no point getting it. I got that fruit, I got those benefits, simply because I was lucky to have found the man I found. Simply because I was lucky. So I found a man who believed in marriage and was willing to work to make it happen. I learned a lot too about guys from my brothers. I had one who was really very, you know, one of the ladies' men, right? He's late now, but I watch him one girl coming from the front door, another girl is going through the back door. But I could tell the girls that were special to them. I could tell just by the fact that your name is mentioned or you come near, everything else pales. Everything else pales. And they can't pretend for long. They can't. Because I knew that guys always had more than one girlfriend. Always. So it wasn't a surprise to me. So before a guy can convince me, ah. What did she share? It would have worked. I would have seen it. Like my husband, he was in Worry and I was in Benin. You know, he would call me. Then there were no phones, so he would call me and talk and talk and talk. After about maybe, and I asked him, where are you calling from? He told me how he, he told me he's calling from his older sister's friend's office. Abba. Then I knew that this guy is serious. Ah, ah. You will leave your office, drive without shame to some office and tell them you want to call one girl in Benin and they'll be talking for hours on the phone. And I just knew that he cared for me. I knew that I was important to him. Not necessarily that I was somebody he wanted to marry, but I was important. I mattered to him. Did you ask them what you wanted? Yeah. Did you want to have that? No, 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 not at all. Seven, because the first one is not my biological daughter. Like I told you, my husband was seeing somebody else. The person was even pregnant. The first thing he told me was, this way I'm pregnant. I'm like, this guy's crazy. But you see, he made me respect him. He says, he told the girl very clearly, I don't want to marry you, but I have no problem with it. I'll take the child, not to the girl home, to the parents. I'll do whatever. You know what I mean? But he's a man that knew what he wanted and he hadn't seen it. So I was teasing him. I said, you hadn't seen it, why were you? He says, well, I mean, every young guy, I mean, got around so but I respected him that he could have married 
my daughter's mother just because he wanted to be good. But he said, look, he's married for the rest of his life. He can't make a mistake. And he told her very clearly. Then she was born again and very worried. He said, look, not the child. This child didn't ask to come to this world. Let's have this child. Because the woman is A.S. He is A.S. And he says, there's no way I'm going to marry somebody who's A.S. I said, fine, we'll take the child. No problem. Because I grew up in a home where my home was open to everybody, so it was not difficult for me. But the mom wasn't very keen because she thought she could make him marry her. And she held out for two years. But we didn't get married until about two years after because I said, I don't want this guy. He chased, chased, chased. I don't want, I don't want this wahala. I don't want this trouble. What can I start life? You know, I don't want this guy. But he was persistent because he knew what he wanted. So I took her, but we didn't raise her. She only came to us when she was um, 19. No, 17 because she's almost 30, 29 now. But why did she come to us? Because her parents were breaking up, things were tough. Her mom called her and said, ah, look, she wants to come home. But I had raised my kids to know that they had an older sister. So they knew when she walked into our house and everybody screamed, oh, he's former because we've been taking pictures. Before that, for the past two years, I've been telling him, look, we've got to, she's now a teenager. She's got to come back. But unfortunately, the mom wasn't too happy. She didn't tell her, right? early enough, but this girl had found out much longer than they realized that the father was not her biological father. So everything went awry, but because we were ready, we took her, no problem. But when we got married, it was like, okay, we're gonna have three kids, you know, one girl, two boys, so that way we now have two girls and two boys. That was our desire, and that's how God gave it to us. I had a daughter and then two sons. But by the time I had my second son, I had, a, I had a brother, this is my late brother, he was my favorite brother, you know, I mean, because, and uh, he had been married for a number of years too and was you know, looking for a child. I was beginning to, beginning to take my faith a little more seriously and I'm like, okay, you know, all these issues about family planning, you've got to be careful. And I told myself, if I can actually trust God with my business, then I was just going to start a business with my business, with my everything. Why can't I trust him with my fertility? But it was easier for me to do because I said, you know what, God, I'm going to stop all of these contraceptives. I'm going to be open to life, right? But I'll be open to life until you give my sister-in-law a child. Number four was coming. Ah, say, Father, this is the one that will bring this baby. I went to the girl's house. We have put your hand on this baby. Let us pray. We prayed. Number four came, no show. She didn't get pregnant. Number five, no show. Number six, our one was going crazy. This girl killed me. This modern time. I said, you didn't know because I couldn't share it with anybody. It was a covenant with God. By the time I had number six, then I had complications. I couldn't, my womb had to be taken out. So I said, go to see now. Show it to Tom. Tom. My style was doesn't have. But guess what? That was a mom. She got pregnant. She got twins. Those twins were due on my birthday. What kind of God do we say? My faith my trust in God is so deep. It's just because of those children. Because he has taken me through a lot with those children. I know that God chooses different things in people's lives to minister to others. For me, it's the kids that I have. And he chose me because I'm in the limelight. It's so incongruous, you know, to have someone like me have six children. But I don't know why I'm talking about it. But today, that's the first thing people ask me. That's my call to fame. You have six children, as if it's by my power. As if anything I do is by my power. No, but those six children keep me on my knees permanently. Plus the extra one I have, seven, permanently. Communication for me was not an accident. It was a decision that I would study drama. Because when I went to school, I could have done mass communication. But the only mass communication degree I could have earned in Nigeria was either in JOS or in Inugu. Unilag wasn't existing then for mass comm department. So, and they were too far from home. So I looked through the jam brochure and I saw that part of the course content for drama was film and television production. And I saw that the head of department then was Wole Shoyinka. I read all the books. I said, ah, okay, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go there. And I'm going to specialize in film and TV. There was option of film and TV, acting, script writing, or music. So that's how I ended up in university for to study. 
Of course, Kungi, we used to call him Kungi, was a head of department, and he was a fun lecturer and all of that. And um, my desire was to graduate as quickly as possible, head to Lagos, and then be work in an agency. But then I got posted to Sakoto for youth service. And then I was like, I ain't going to Sakoto. On that note, I'd heard all kinds of stories about Sakoto. So one week, two weeks, three weeks, my dad come back from Okwande. You won't go to Sokoto. I said, that I can't. Now use your influence. Change it. We could change it even then. That was 1983. I said, no, no, no. I, ah, he said, you must go to Sokoto. What I'll do for you is the NTA GM here is my friend. I'll give him a letter. I'll ask him to write you a letter. You go to Sokoto and then you work in NTA there. That's how my romance with NTA started. So he said, it was a compromise. He sent a driver to take me. We drove 13 hours to get to Sokoto. But it was an eye-opener. It's what's made me the true Nigerian. I describe myself as a true Nigerian because I saw another side of Nigeria I had never seen. But then I didn't get a job with the NTA I, because I couldn't get a job. I didn't want to stay in Sokoto. So I came back home to Benin. When I came back to Benin, I couldn't get, there was, I mean, I couldn't get into NTA in Benin. I just said, okay, my dad says, go and teach. I mean, I was teaching in the secondary school until the state television station auditioned for newscasters. And that says, oh, this one, yeah, speaking to Ibo in the house, go and audition for newscaster. So I auditioned for newscaster, and I got the job as a newscaster. But I told them, I can be a reporter too. And they said, oh, really? I said, yes, because I'm trained to do that. I can go out, I can. So they said, okay. So I was newscaster reporter working there. When this guy comes into my life, and I have to get married, and I went back, I went to to do my master's, you know. And I'm like, okay. He was transferred, he was moving to Lagos. I had to come to Lagos. I said, okay. Daddy, now you're going to have to use your influence. I must go to Lagos to go and work in NTA. So we talked to the NTA people in Benin. I transferred my services to NTA. And I ended up in NTA network service as a reporter. So, and I loved my job because it was like, this is what I've always wanted to do. The day I decided to quit was I just got to the office and I found myself quarreling with somebody who was my friend otherwise. Why? You, I got to the editing suite before you. And we have quarreling. The next morning, I just put in my resignation. I said, this is not worth it. I was thinking of starting a TV show, women's show, because all the while I was a reporter, it was difficult to find strong women that you could interview. I remember meeting your mom, and you don't find their stories anymore. I'm like, these people are very tough cookies. They are great women, but they won't talk about them because uh, you talk about the woman, you're talking about husband, you're talking about this, you're talking about that. What about the woman herself? You know what I mean? You know, so I used to dream of being able to do that. And he says, what do you know about? Uh, tell, you know, one television is expensive. Why don't you do this your women's thing as a because he's a management consultant, so that's how they think. They're strategists. He's a strategist expert as a as a newsletter that can become a magazine. So that's not a bad idea. Just to feature women, tell their stories, so that other women will see it and be empowered and be encouraged. You know, 1980, well, 1998. I said, okay, I would do so. So we're putting all the things together. But in the course, as I retired, as I, as I retired, at that time, Bangida had said it was okay if you had worked 15 years, you can retire and get full benefits. So I just retired and left. But in the course of doing that, NTA now wanted a, a presenter for a show, a morning show. It was NTA Channel 5, and they asked what I would do. I said, yeah, so how much? 5,000, I would do it. It's my salary for one month. I'll do it. So that distracted me a bit. So I couldn't do the print I wanted to do. I said, let's just do this TV. Then I, I had a name. It was called, supposed to be called Flair. So I'm going to call the magazine Flair. But before I could get anything, else, there was a magazine on the street called Flair. I'm like, oh yeah, that was just as well. Somebody's done it, so let me just forget. So we said, do this your magazine. Make it a TV show. We are in NTA now. Beg them for time and you do that. That's how today's woman started. So I said, okay, that's not a bad idea. I can do today's woman with ideas. So if I don't have cameras, whatever, why don't I do it in collaboration with them? That time there was no thing like independent, independent production was just beginning to start. So I said, you know what, I will give this show, I will create this my show, you guys give me six weeks to pay, right? But we'll start and then we just use the facilities, that it's on your station, no charges. If I get money, we we'll split it. That was then, but because of my boss, I said, okay, why not? It's a good show. I didn't have to go out. He just said, okay, you know what, just put flats, three-dimensional, put a telephone in the studio, put a woman there, you go live, and it's very exciting. That's how today's woman started on television. So I did that 10 years. Today's woman on television. But I was just tired of doing the same thing on television, and I wanted to do more. I was also presenting, I kept presenting for Channel 5. 
they came up with a show called uh, One on One. I think it's still on now, an interview show. So I was still doing both, but I just wasn't still that satisfied with having explored all the possibilities in my life. So I still had that desire to do the magazine I wanted to do. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to do my magazine. Then TV became what I call an all commerce affair. If you're good looking, if you're tall and everything, and they think you can speak some English, you can be a presenter. So I just figured, well, let's just leave TV. And um, it was getting more expensive to produce. And uh, we have the old school. We really didn't uh, do a lot of marketing. I said, look, let me just give that up for now and do my magazine. And that's what I've done until we kept on saying, come back to TV, come back to TV. I'm like, okay, there could still be room because some of the skills that I have, which is a gift, I just interviewing skills, you know. I, I seem to have a way with getting people to speak. It's just interviewing skills. I said, if I have that, let me still try and use it to do something at least. That's how we started seriously speaking again in collaboration with the Ultima Studios. And so I'm still on TV. But for me, it's more about communication, helping people understand each other better, you know, or understand people or issues better. That's what drives me more than anything. If I have to own my television station or my magazine or my radio station to do that, I will do it. Last year in August, I went home. How you go? You say hello and a hi and go away. Mom says, ah, there's something unusual about my breasts. She doesn't ever say anything. I said, let me see. And she lifts up her breast, her, her, her blouse. And I see that one breast is so, I had to hold myself to scream. You know what I mean? But I knew it was dangerous. One was much bigger. It was big. And I'm like, ah, mom, why didn't you say this? I didn't know it was anything. And it's not pain in me. But I just, because it was getting bigger, one was much bigger than the other. So I said, ah, the next morning, I came for an event that day. I was supposed to go to an event the next morning, but I canceled, called, I know a specialist in over a town in Delta, which is about 30 minutes from Benin. I called the specialist and said, I'm bringing my mom first. And he said, why are we going? He said, we're going out. I got in the car, we drove there. He looked and he said, ah, this is cancer. It's a lump. It's most likely cancer. I said, cancer at 82. Okay, how can? So, he said, well, we should go for the mammogram. We did all of those things. We did the first test. We did the histology. Eventually, she was uh, confirmed. It was confirmed to be cancer in, um, was it November? Last year. So we chose the option of drugs. Because doctor said it might be hormonal, hormonal right? And uh, we chose the option of drugs for her. We had done drugs for about three months. And uh, he, she came back and doctor said, well, we have to actually do a mastectomy. So it was our responsibility to not call her and tell her, Mom, look, we've got to take this thing out. We had told her before, I said, no, it's not cancer, I will let bother. So we told her, well, Mom, actually, it's cancer, you've got to take it out. I'm glad we took the action that we did and we found out on time. Because I lost my brother. You know, I told her about my brother I like, my, my favorite brother, because he was, he was everybody's man. He was, a, he was a good man. He died from T-cell lymphoma. It's a cancer that resides in the nose. T-cell lymphoma. Now, we had thought he had... Um, sinuses for a long time. He had been running the temperature, he had been feeling ill and tired, he wasn't eating well. But we just figured that, I mean, maybe it's malaria, they were treated for malaria. So, but he went on vacation that summer and he collapsed in the store. And he just never came home. He spent three years in hospital in America. He would come home, you know, with this. The next thing we heard that actually he, he collapsed because his kidneys backed up. Ha, kidney scare. What does that mean? But by the time they did test, it was because he and they couldn't treat the kidneys because they found out he had T cell lymphoma. So they had to do radiation to first of all bring down those. So I know all about cancer and I'm like, if only we had known. Because the doctor called, I was the last person, family member to see him. When I saw him, I was so pained. Because if we had known earlier, we could have helped my brother. He didn't have to die. It says purely environmental, purely. What you eat, what you inhale, purely environmental. And they couldn't detect in time. They said he had sinuses. He already had a growth. Something was going on there. And it was too late. His kidneys had packed up. But it was a big one. So it was still going on like everything was okay. Bad diet, stress, all those things. And the doctor doesn't pick it up. He didn't make it. My sister, my younger sister, 
two years ago, no, five years now, because it's her fifth year of living cancer free. Five years ago, she had a lump. So we knew what to do, we are prepared. That's why I decided to share that online. I said, listen, you've got to prepare yourself and learn as much as possible. I don't think there's anybody in this country who doesn't know one person that has suffered from cancer. But what I'm praying for, which can still happen, is that we might just get there and find out that the, the lump has shrunk. Anything can happen. I just get there and find out because she's still continuing the medication that we are on. Maybe this delay, because she says she doesn't want to go to her grave. Because the truth is, what she has, the doctor says, it's take two. Nothing may happen for another three to four, five years. She can just live like that. You know, we don't know how long she's going to live for. But if she does get ill, it's going to be nasty. But she was still very particular. How am I going to cut this thing off? I don't want to go to, I don't want, I don't want. You push, just leave me. Because since my brother died, both of them have been praying for death and death hasn't come. Because her tribute to my dad, there was a line she put there. Oh, now you are going to join, you know, Usayande, my brother. And you have left me alone. You know, every time a child comes in, she's assured that at least they are still alive. We don't know who's going to die first. So for them, they are worried that their children are going to die before them. That's why she says, just leave me. Eh? So you can imagine how painful it is for us to actually leave our mom or do her wish. What if she lives to be old and she becomes sick? What if she dies in two years? Why don't you just leave her with her complete breast and let her be? Because she'd rather die. merciful God. That's why we pray for old age. It's a good prayer. Because in old age, you realize that there's more to life than you. Because you'd have seen it all, done it all, do whatever, and you can now reflect on your life. I told myself recently that, you know, the best thing I've ever had is just knowing that God is there. Knowing that I can go to God. That's what has kept me going. And it became even more of an issue because I had a number of children. So I'm constantly begging God, hey, we can't pay school fees. Hey, we have to do this. Hey, this one, you know, I tell people when everybody's going to God in one place, I'm going with seven, come on, seven. So it's going to feel it, feel it, and put a little extra on the side. So, but it's taught me to be more reflective and taught me to be more concerned about others than myself. I probably could never have bought, I still can't buy the best that I would like to buy. That's the best. I mean, drive the kind of car I want to drive. Because when I think about school fees, as the kids, I have to step down my taste, step down my taste, you know, instead of me having three Gucci bags, I have one Gucci bag, you know what I mean? So it's taught me to manage my taste and it's made me even closer to God. But I thank God that I've had to ask God for a lot of things. So I had to bring God into my life. For others, it may be looking for a child. For others, it may be looking for a husband. For others, it may be looking for a job. There's something that carries us to God. And if we stay with God, He shows us other things along the way. He may not give you that thing that you wanted. When you want it, He never does anyway. But it will unfold. Your life will unfold before Him beautifully. That's where we get the peace from. It's like I told you, when I was having those kids, say, well, God, if they love me, they love you. That's all he needs. So, if they, so who cares? If it's me they're laughing at, it's God they're laughing at. Maybe he wants them to laugh at me at that point in time. I remember driving once in my battered old, um, it was a Nissan, I had a battered Nissan. And I was driving on, the AC wasn't working. I was sweating, though I was living in VGC. There was this nice young babe, beautiful like you, in a Jeep, sitting right by my side. There was I sweating. I said, this guy's going to recognize me. Is that not the woman we see on television? You know what I mean? And I was so angry. But in the same moment, I realized that she's probably going to look at, oh, she's real. And that probably ministers something different to her. But I'm in a car. There are people who don't even have a car. Do you understand? They just don't even have a car. So, but because of these little deprivations or little, it's made me to be more spiritual inclined. And I thank God for that. So whatever crosses that we have, they are the path through which we are going to have our resurrections. That's just me.